Hey, uh, it's nice, so nice to meet you, Bella. Uh, my name is Monleo Locanti. My I record and produce under the band name uh, Hydro Embers and the Skin Tide Card. Um, and I've been making music in, well, one form or another for, you know, almost over 30 years at this point. I would say this most recent incarnation, uh, which is mostly uh, recording, composing, and producing by myself is, has been active for like the last dozen years or so, maybe a little more, 20, 2010, I think. Yeah, cool. Well, the first thing that caught my eye was the, was your band name. So I'm curious how that came to be. Yeah, uh, the band name is, uh, so in 2006, I, I was in a, a real band or, you know, or whatever, a band with other people, uh, a couple friends of mine in New York City, and um, and we we were really struggling on band name. Uh, and so, at one point, the closest one we came to was someone really liked just the name Embers. Um, but we we knew another band, another artist going by that name. And so, believe it or not, I plugged the word Embers into one of those old school like internet band name generators, and the thing that it spit out was Hydro Embers in the Skin Tight Card. And and uh, my bandmates hated it, right? Obviously, because it's it's sort of a ridiculous name, and they're like, "No, no, no, we can't, we can't use that." Uh, but I always really liked it because I thought it was so just egregiously weird. Um, and so I sort of sat on it for a couple of years, and then when I decided to start kind of putting my own projects out, I kind of picked it up and I said, "Hey, I don't think anyone else is going to use this." So, uh, so that's where it comes from. Yeah, I think that's sick, and definitely when you Google that, nothing else but your music is probably going to come up. Yeah. But speaking of your music, could you tell us, like, how would you describe your sound? Yeah, I, I used, I, I basically just, I used to describe it as kind of aspiring towards being a, a, a worse version of Tycho, uh, yeah. sort of, sort of self-deprecating a little bit, but there's a lot of stuff, like, I, I made a decision very consciously, uh, at some point 15 years ago to stop using vocals um, and stop using lyrics for most of my stuff. And so it's all instrumental. Um, I like to think of it sometimes as like music to work to or to code to. Um, so it's, there's supposed to be like a meditative aspect to it. It, it tends to be more electronic based, but you know, I play guitar, I play drums, I play a little bass. Uh, and so there's often sort of real instruments kind of sequenced or sampled or looped or composed in there um but it's you know it, it uh it sort of varies and with each album sometimes i'm much more consciously trying to adhere towards a strict song format structure and sometimes i say hey look this is just going to be 15 minutes of whatever happens to happen in a system cool well that's awesome so i'll i'm curious about your gear but like, what is your typical production setup when you do record? Kind of depends. Um, the A lot of times what I find is that I start... So sorry, let, let me go back. Uh, I try to give myself a set of constraints on every project because I found that without the constraints, um, the a body of work ends up sounding really not super uh, consistent or coherent um, because, you know, I, I sort of get really interested in one thing or another and that can kind of vary. Uh, and so in order to kind of glue that together, uh, one thing I, I started doing was just saying, hey, look, all, all the instruments need to be the same or, you know, I've done the thing where I've taken a specific like fixed set of audio, call it a minute or a minute and 30 seconds with a variety of sounds on it and said, okay, everything on this album is going to come from this minute and 30 seconds and, you know, kind of chopping it up and, and, uh, and making it sure, making sure that everything kind of exists in a similar sound space. Um, at the same time, you know, sometimes I've done projects where it's been uh, focused more on like a study of craft and composition where I'll say, hey, look, the, the constraint here is you know, everything has to be a like A, B, A, B, C, B kind of structure, um, or I'll be deconstructing other songs and um, and adhering whatever I'm building to those specific structures. Uh, and, and so it depending on what I'm doing, it can start in a bunch of different places. I'm, I'm a long time Ableton person, right? Ableton was as like the DAW I've been using since 
I don't know if I got on it in version one, but certainly by version two, I was using it. Uh, and so if I'm going to do something software based, it will start in Ableton usually and usually start with just, you know, a couple session tracks, um, usually with a MIDI instrument or two, just kind of playing around with different ideas. Um, I've also been doing a bunch more stuff sort of out of the box lately. Uh, and for that, there's been a variety of sort of uh, generative starts, but lately it's been the dig attacked a lot for both for drum samples and for kind of tone samples. And then sequenced, the sequencer kind of depends. And I'm honestly, I, I'm sort of in an eternal struggle for the right sequencer. Uh, and I, I can't, I can't say that I've found it yet, but I've had a lot of them come in the house and, uh, and then kind of head back out through different times. All right, well, cool. Um, oops, sorry. Um, like, what are your favorite synthesizers, software-wise or just like physical-wise? Yeah. Uh, physical-wise, again, it's been another one where things come and things go. The the one synthesizer actually that has stayed the entire time um, was is a uh, I use a Waldorf Blofeld a lot. Um, and it's just, it's a really nice sort of utility knife synth, right? Where it's, it's digital, but it has a bunch of different sort of types of sounds. Uh, you, I have the sampler plug in for it. And so that expands its range. Um, the fact that it's multi-timbral uh, is actually pretty incredible because I can use it. I can use multiple sounds and multiple voices all through one, um, one sequencer, uh, which is really nice. Um, and so it, it, it's just stuck around because every time I think about getting rid of it, you know, I'll, I'll just say, I'll, I'll put it in a box, you know, I'll put it in the closet for six months and then inevitably something comes up where I say, oh, I need something. And I kind of reach for it because I know it can do it. Um, I went through a big Moog phase, right? I had like the triple stack of Mother 32 and Subharmonicon. Uh, I had a grandmother for a little while. Um, I really love that sort of harsh, not harsh, but warm analog bite on stuff. And so I will, I will sometimes try to use that. And then um, one thing that I did that was kind of interesting for a while was I would, I would be driving that analog sound through from Ableton, right? So I'd have a MIDI track in Ableton, you know, drive it out to the analog and then record it back in. And then once that track was fixed, I would take the MIDI track and then put a soft synth on it. Um, and, and so, you know, sometimes that was stock Ableton stuff, actually. Like, I, I kind of like their electric plugin and their wavetable plugin. Um, and then I would sort of left, right the analog track with the MIDI track and then change a few notes or change a few qualities of the audio. And so it occasionally created this really cool like almost stereo space where it was mostly playing in unison. Um, but then every once in a while, there would be like a slight adjustment on a note, um, but only in a certain tonal range that would kind of like give a little spice to things. All right, cool. Um, let's see. So when it comes to like actually making a song, how do you like know what effects to use? How do you, what's your approach? Yeah, it's changed a little bit over time. So I used to be of the school that everything would be dry until I was super happy with the layout and the structure and the comp and composition. And only then would I start putting effects on. And especially when I would add guitar to stuff, this was like something I was super committed to is I would I would go dry into the Ableton with my guitar, with one of my guitars, um, and unless I was really happy with how the guitar sounded um, in that form, I would not add anything to it. What I found that led to was like, to some degree, it changed which effects I would ever put on there because the play style, my play style would in some cases be busy enough or noisy enough um, that certain types of more complex effects or beds just like wouldn't make any sense uh, because there were... There, I couldn't hear that the out the real output while I was playing. And so over time, what I've changed is um, I've started using the guitar a lot less as a primary instrument and a lot more as almost like a, a pad or bed paintbrush. 
And so for something like that, you know, what I will try to do actually is, is dial in my effects loop before I go into the computer, right? And, and I do a variety of different stuff right now. I've always been a big delay person. I'm still a big delay person, right? So right now I think my chain is um, like, I've got, a, I've got a distortion pedal. I've got an OCD full tone that I use for a little bit of warmth. Um, and then I have a chorus, a boss super chorus that I, I really keep at almost like only a 10% dry wet combo. Um, again, just for a little modulation, and then I get really heavy into delay and reverb. So I have a, I have a Boss analog delay, uh, Waza Craft, um, that I really like for, um, for sort of a short response to, to give some, uh, some real body to it. And then I've got a, a variety of digital delays that I kind of bring in and out. I have a Maris Polymoon that I like. I have that the Strymon L Capistan tape delay that I that I really like. Uh, I just got the Meraki analog delay, which was actually which was Dave's recommendation. I I, I will admit I have not actually uh, turned it on that much, but I I like what I've heard so far. Um, and then actually, you know, through buy or borrow, I I tried a bunch of different classic delays, right? I tried the Strymon timeline. Like I try to think every delay pedal on there. Uh, and then at the end, I have a reverb. And again, I have a variety of reverbs. Right now, I'm I'm really finding a lot of value in a, the Boss Digital sort of RV5 reverb, um, but I also have a Maris Mercury that I really like. Um, and then occasionally, if I'm getting super, uh, super nuts, I have a hologram, hologram micro, uh, microcosm that I put on if I'm really looking for something that just doesn't sound anything like uh, a guitar at the end. Uh, and then I'll play that sort of directly in alongside the backing track. So I, so I can be a little more judicious about like where I'm painting and where I'm playing notes. Yeah. I love the way that you said paintbrush. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Hey, Molly, I would be very interested to hear your approach for effects with synthesized synthesizer instruments and anything that you're doing in the box. And I know so many people now are going to a hybrid setup where, yes, you may be doing a lot of things in Ableton or other places, but as easy as guitar effects have made it for everyone to use now in Signal Chain, how much external effects are you using with your synthesis setup? Uh, well, so when, it's, when the synthesizer is out of the box, like the Blofeld um, or, or anything like that, uh, I think of it a lot like a guitar, right? And, and, and so it, it can be anything from, sometimes it's nothing, right? Sometimes, sometimes it's clean. Sometimes I have that whole effects loop I just took you through on the end of the synthesizer. Um, and I, you know, it tends to be less, right? Like I, because a, a lot of these synthesizers have reasonable effects just within themselves, right? Like the dig attack will give you an onboard delay. It will give you an onboard reverb. I don't need to like, you know, triple that or something. Um, but what, but, you know, sometimes you, you, you fall in love with a certain sound. Like I, I hate to harp on it, but man, like that Strymon L cap tape delay really gives you a sound that I, I've never found anywhere else. And so even if I'm going, if I'm going into Ableton for recording with any synthesizer, sometimes I'll just kind of throw that on there and just, even turn it on at a really low um, mix to get a little bit extra warmth, a little bit extra delay coming in. Um, when I'm strictly in the box, it kind of depends. So like I'm a little lazy about running signal out, chaining through and then back in. It's not to say I don't ever do it, but like it, it, it's, I have to really find a reason that I feel that what I'm getting in the box isn't going to be good enough. Um, I use a lot of Ableton stock effects with my own presets and my own tweaks to them. Uh, the only thing that I consistently go outside of is reverb. Um, we're uh, in a little bit of delay where I use, I use the Valhalla plugins pretty exclusively. Uh, I think he does a really nice job of just having nice big single use plugins that just always sound really good. So like the, the Valhalla spring reverb is always in my default template. Like that is return channel a for reverb is the Valhalla spring or sorry, Valhalla plate reverb. And sometimes I, you know, adjust which one I'm using, but almost every track is on there for a return channel. 
Um, and the same with a, you know, a fil the, the Ableton filter delay uh, is on there. And that's my kind of A and B. And then, and then sometimes there's more, right? Sometimes I'll put like a C on there that's a chorus or a D on there that's a different type of reverb, maybe more of a ping pong sound uh, versus a filter sound. But by default, everything gets a little reverb and then everything gets a little bit of delay. Um, I d I've, over the years, I've done less and less uh, effects on the instruments themselves um, because I'm, one thing I have really appreciated about the send return channels, which is not a new trick, it's like a super old trick, but I came to it really late, was uh, the more those effects are consistent, the more you can glue together everything, everything that's kind of in there. And one problem that I encountered when I first started uh, was all my stuff kind of sounded like it was being played in different rooms by different people, right? Like it was very obvious that like, there's no possible way that that was happening in one room altogether. Uh, and coming from a world of guitar and bands, like that always felt super weird to me, right? That that it didn't feel like you kind of sat down and had the thing, you know, with a group of folks. Yeah. Well, have you ever used like um, field recording or do you sample any? Sometimes, yeah, I, I do. It, it um, so let's see when when are the two places? So I've done entire I've done entire albums off of a field recording. Uh, there there I have two on there, and I don't remember the names of them. Um, but there's one album that I have on there that is exclusively a minute and thirty second field recording of my son playing with um, hey, uh, this is a very specific product uh, call out, but uh. My son was really obsessed with hape marble towers when he was a kid. So there's these blocks that you build, the marbles run through them. Um, and they're they're really lovely sonically because they both have like kind of the click clack of glass falling on wood. And then and then hape, and it may actually be hape. I don't I don't remember. It's a I think it's a Swedish or Norwegian company. They've got little um tone blocks. And so you can put these little named notes and they're there it's deep enough where they like tell you which notes they are right so it's it's a g major scale they'll give you a to a to g with an f sharp and you can kind of put them on there and so the marbles can kind of fall and make sounds on the different things and so i have you know he was always playing with it he was obsessed with it for years and so i would just always be hearing it in the in the house and i took a recording of him you know a minute and 30 seconds uh, about of just like him playing with it. And so it's this amazing clip where it's got some percussive stuff, right? Cause there's a lot of like marbles and clicks falling on different surfaces. And then there's the notes here and there, the little bell notes. And then there's him, he's sort of talking and like, it wasn't, he was still, I think he knew how to talk, but you know, he, he was just very excited about it. And so it wasn't necessarily words getting from him but a lot of tones. Um, and I took all that and basically said, okay, I'm going to chop this up and really dig in and find this as my sample library. Uh, and so obviously I got a bunch of rich material for percussion off the marbles and off the wood. Um, I got some really nice tones off the bells. And then I got a few really nice longer tones off his voice that I was able to kind of like manipulate and stretch out. Um, and then I had to auto tune his voice a little bit, right? Because, uh, you know, he wasn't necessarily, you know, laughing and talking in in the key of g but you know it wasn't it wasn't too bad uh, to be able to do that and then once i had that i basically loaded in a set of samplers in ableton samplers and simplers and said you know this is this is the color palette right this is what i'm gonna let's see how far i can really go let's see how many different varieties of things i can do like just with that one thing um so i do a little of that i i occasionally but less often you know will if i'm out walking around and I hear something interesting and, and I live right near a forest. And so sometimes it's wood. I also live near, uh, not too far away from the ocean. There's like, I live in a park at the end of the parks, the ocean. So I get some good kind of ocean sounds. Um, it's all iPhone generally, right? I'm sort of endlessly eyeing the field recording stuff. In fact, I think I've got the a Zoom H8 sitting here in a box that I'm like, okay, maybe I will take this out and use it. But I, ultimately, you know, the best tool is kind of the one in your pocket, right? And the phone is always in my pocket and and it's good enough where 
uh, I think I'd rather I'd rather just have that and kind of make do with the the microphone sound quality that you get versus saying, oh, I will intentionally kind of have this other thing that I kind of carry around. Yeah. Is well speaking of like finding something niche like a toy to use, do you have a signature like technique or piece of gear that you would say defines your sound? Probably not. It's changed so much over the years. I'm trying to think of consistency. So like uh, I it'll pro it would be hard to find an album where I didn't like uh, have at least one instrument sitting on a ping pong delay kind of in the background uh, going back and forth. Um, there's certainly some albums where like, there's no guitar. Um, there are certainly some where like there's no kind of consistency of um, consistency, consistency of instrumentation. Uh, so I, I there probably isn't one. It's probably more a like, like I think of a lot of what I do as... Um, there's a big analog in my head for music and sort of exercise, right? Where like, I'm not always as concerned with the outcome as I am with the process and, and I am with just like the practice of it. Uh, and so, you know, just as like in my physical practice, I may try boxing for six months uh, and then decide I like it or don't. Like in my musical practice, I try to push myself to the same diligence. So I try to say, hey, like, you will just get to learn this thing really deeply. And even if you never use it again, like that's okay, actually. Like that's that's part of the journey. Yeah. Well, speaking of like how you said you had to give yourself some constraints, do you do anything that would be, some would say like unconventional to like make your songs? Hmm, unconventional. Let's see. Um... Probably, probably not so unconventional. Uh, the most unconventional thing I do is I occasionally, um, when I get into much more sort of like drone or ambient music, probably the most unconventional thing I do is occasionally I will set up systems of sound that I only have a like, call it 50% predictive idea of what's gonna happen when I touch anything and then just sort of hit record and like see if I can wrangle those things together in a in a way that I like. Uh, and I, as you might imagine, you know, am sometimes successful and sometimes like terrible thing, not terrible, but things I do not intend to happen where everything feeds back or I like accidentally turn off the effects loop somewhere. Um, and when I'm doing that stuff, occasionally I will, I get pretty, I'm pretty open about just sort of printing, <laughs> printing and submitting it versus trying to go back and say, oh, let me find the real nuggets in there. Mm -hmm. um, as the, the other thing I will do sometimes that's a little bit unconventional is um, it's probably not that unconventional, but I have a bunch of old tapes of like jam sessions I used to do uh, years ago with friends. And I, I farm those pretty extensively for like, micro sounds or micro samples uh, where I can say, okay, like what's the like uh, half second or one second in these three minutes that I can kind of build on and uh, make something compelling out of it. It's not dissimilar from what an artist like the field does. Uh, obviously he is much more um, extensive than I am, right? Where he'll have hundreds and hundreds of micro samples in an entire track and I usually am looking for like a single snippet of inspiration that I then try to to build around. So do you typically just hit record and like just go and try to make a song like in one take or do you prefer to like layer them? Uh, my ideal state is being able to hit just go and do it in one take. I'm I'm honestly not there yet. Um, I, I've maybe found a couple times where I have been happy enough with the systems and the layering um, that I felt it was both rich enough and had enough um, variation to it. Probably the biggest challenge I find with that approach for me is um, I either have not enough hands, right? And so I get something going and then I layer something else on on top of it. 
but then the first thing needs to be changed. I have to go back and change the first thing. And then the second thing gets too old. And I haven't quite, um, I haven't quite found the good balance between being uh, proficient and flexible enough with the control of that versus, you know, the inevitable place that you I get to a lot is you say, well, I'll just sequence this, right? Like, I know I wanted to do these things. And so I'll just, you know, go into the dig attack and make a song and it'll play in this order. And at that point, that's like a little bit moving away from what I want to be doing, right? Like, if I'm going to sit down and sequence the thing, I should really just kind of be in Ableton, right? I should, or I should be in like a more uh, official software synth. And so I'm always kind of push pulling the urge to say, hey, you want these things to change and you want them to change at this time, just go and say, hey, four bars of this, four bars of this. And in a totally free form environment, uh, it is hard, I think, to get the variation and the like feel of movement that um, that I hear in my head a lot, right? Because when I listen, a lot of the music I listen to is sort of, you know, minimalist house or, you know, melodic techno, melodic house. And, and in that music, like there are changes coming every eight bars, right? And so every eight to 16 bars, you're, you have one or two new things that are either coming in and going out. Um, and that can be a lot harder to kind of replicate in a, uh, in a system, especially when part of the magic of the system is I don't always know what's going to happen when I press a button. Yeah. How would you say you balance like drawing in some emotion with the technology to your music yeah that's actually one of the hard i think hardest things that taking the step of removing um vocals and removing lyrics has been because i think you know when i listen to music when i listen to music i get a lot of um I get a lot of emotional tie and connection out of people's words, out of people's voices. And that's obviously a very human thing, right? Like I worked in, in my other life, you, you know, I, I work in technology. And so I know a lot about kind of the emotional connection people have to voices and it's profound, right? Like there are books and books on, you know, what a quality of someone's timber will just make you think naturally without them even saying anything. Uh, and so that's a big removal. Um, you know what, I, I think the part of the way I try to bring more emotion in, um, at least for me, is, you know, there are certain progressions or intervals or like melodic motifs that I, when I find one, especially when I find one that I feel is really powerful, like I try to really, um, A, kind of like, not hammer it in is kind of the wrong word, but make sure that it's being given uh, a lot of space and a lot of airtime and a lot of focus within the context of the song, right? One of the things that frustrates me the most when I listen to music is occasionally, and, and you know, it, it's not certainly the artist has a different interpretation of it, but occasionally I will hear what I feel is a super powerful, you know, second or two of the music and I will kind of want it to come back again. And, and then sometimes it never does, right? Like th it can be true, uh, certainly for guitar solos, but even in, uh, you know, uh, dance music or house music, sometimes like that one break or that one build will be incredible. And I'll say, oh, well, I, you know, I sort of want that more. Um, on the other side though, right? Like if you did that thing 18 times, you know, by time number three, it would sort of lose its, lose its value. Uh, and so I try to be super attentive to, you know, if the focus of the song and the melodic center and emotional center of the song is this build, or is this like, you know, call it four bars where everything is sort of firing, this is the emotional height. How am I properly supporting that on both sides, right? And how am I making sure that if I kind of draw the sonic and emotional arc of a track that, you know, it has a build, it has a peak, and then it's sort of like, uh, has a has an outro versus um, when I've done it poorly and I've done it poorly plenty of times, you know, you sort of, I race to the height within a minute and then I spend four minutes sort of like at that high energy moment. Um, and it's it just doesn't have the same impact on someone. You know, your ears very quickly attuned to it and you kind of get bored or start looking for the next thing. Yeah, well, I think a lot of the gearheads will appreciate how you switch things up and you don't try to stick to one thing kind of force yourself to get out of your comfort zone and like 
to find your own consistencies, if that makes sense. But yeah, what advice would you give to someone that wants to get into like ambient and electronic music? Uh, let's see. I would. I would, I would give two pieces of totally conflicting advice um, and that there's a balance in between. So the first thing I would say is like, you just, it's really useful to listen to the tracks that you like um, actively. And when I say actively, like I learned so much and this was really late when I started, really late when I started making music that I, that I sit down and actually actively listen to the stuff I loved and say, okay, I'm going to listen to this three or four times and I'm going to actually like sit and chart it out. Right. And so I've got Ableton files where um, it's like, you know, the track will be up top. And then underneath, I, every other track is just a track of notes on what's going on. And so it's like, you know, bass comes in here, drums come in here, like kick drum goes out there. And I had to do that deconstruction a bunch of times before I really started to appreciate the richness and the, complexity that was required to get something that sort of sounded simple right it can sound orally simple but then the more you dig in the more you the more you get to like really appreciate what's underneath and so uh i think that is a super worthwhile exercise and it's a very analytical exercise and then the conflicting piece of advice i would give is like it doesn't really matter what everyone else has done um you just sort of want to find a thing that compels you that you can listen to endlessly. And I've done that too, right? Where I have found loops or I found bars and I've just kind of been so uh, mystified by them that I've just kind of like took my hands off the keyboard, sat back and just like, let it go for, you know, 10 minutes or something like that. And just started to really hear like, whatever it was that was kind of pulling me towards it. Um, and I think both are important, right? Like it's, it's hard to find your own voice if you're, or it was hard for me to find my own voice when I was only trying to duplicate what other people were doing. Um, but when I was only trying to do my own thing, I often would sort of look at it at the end and say, that wasn't really what I wanted, right? Like it, it wasn't, I couldn't quite map what was in my head to um, to what ended up kind of on the machines in part because like, there was sort of a lack of craft and a lack of expertise. So I need a little bit of both. Um, and then I guess the other thing I would say is it is a lot like exercise, right? Where like, it doesn't necessarily matter how much you do it at what rate, other than to say, you know, the best day to start is today, right? The best day was yesterday, the better day is today. Um, and that, you know, it is a lifelong kind of process and journey. And so the more you, the more sit down and do it, the better it gets. And, um, and, and it, you know, it, 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 uh, it benefits from time as with anything. Who are some of your musical influences that made you want to start making this music? Uh, I, yeah, so I've talked about some of them, um, the, the field, honestly, like the field, the field, especially the, uh, from here I go sublime album really sort of turned me on, uh, and made me listen to, listen to music in a way that, uh, or, or, um, was music of a quality that I kind of did not realize, uh, how much I would have loved, um, but really loved it. Uh, Tycho, I, I, I really enjoyed Tycho's first couple albums. Uh, most, most of the stuff I find is really good. Um, uh, this is an interesting one, but I actually really like, uh, John Frusciani and his sort of journey from being what I would consider like a pretty straightforward, immensely talented, uh, rock and roll guitar player to like the stuff he did with Trick Finger, or I think, you know, he, his name is Trick Finger and, you know, he, I remember really early, even before I was thinking about making this music, listening to his first solo album um, and just saying, wow, this is really very, very different and kind of out there. And so I've always appreciated his willingness to just like go and do something totally different from what he had done before. Um, trying to, those are the first three that come to mind, although it's probably not doing service to a whole bunch of other folks who have influenced me. Uh, ben Bomber is a guy, he, he's sort of a, I think he's 
he's an English or a German DJ and, and a bunch of his sort of melodic techno stuff I found incredibly pleasing and inspiring. He's just a really good example of, you know, everything he does sounds um, really uh, organic and alive, uh, it, it, but there's a ton of sort of detailed craft and, and, uh, and stuff and what he does there that I've really appreciated. Uh, Dave, do you have any gear questions? That there were so many nuggets of gold in there. I don't know that <laughs> we need to go mine for more. Um, you know, I, I started thinking Manlio about you talking at the beginning of this, where you specifically said that in some cases, providing constraints to yourself was was mm -hmm. one of the most important pieces. I would love to hear you elaborate on that, and and I'll I'll give you context. I I personally find as well that in a lot of cases, if I sit down with something like let's say a Line Six Helix, where you can do anything, mm -hmm. it's almost paralysis of options. Whereas if I sit down with an El Capistan delay, which I like you mm -hmm. love, it's one of the best delay pedals on the planet. If I sit down with an L cap and a simple overdrive, it forces me to work within those constraints. I, I would love to hear how providing constraints to yourself helps mold your music. Yeah. Well, you know, I think you kind of hit on it, right? Where where the I mean, there is a real torture of choice in a bunch of these instruments and technologies that we have right and, and like don't get me wrong it's amazing right like i started doing computer based recording in 1999 right like and i i don't and as a home musician i don't know if i was one of the first but like i was fairly early right i bought like a an aardvark 2496 box that like plugged into a PCI card on my desktop computer yep. and like found a copy of Cakewalk. And like, that was my evolution from like a cassette four track, right? Everything I'd done before that had been a cassette four track or cassette eight track. And then I was trying to figure out how to do it with the computer. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you have so many choices and options, it's super hard to figure out what to do. And, and I have definitely spent those days, not with the Helix, but, you know, I had a Kemper profiler for a long time and I would just spend hours, you know, like knob, 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 play stuff. Um, and it's it's fun and, and it's great. Uh, and I even, you know, I even did a couple um a couple albums where I where I wasn't super heavy on constraints, you know, and I was just like, no, I'll just kind of do whatever. And when I listen to them, what I note, not for good or bad, is that they 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 don't necessarily sound like a like a a, a collection of songs that kind of uh, happened in a unified state like place or stage, right? They sound like almost a potpourri of oh, today it was this thing, today it was that thing, today it was that other thing, and that can be okay. Um, but like, I sort of. I really like the music that I make and part of the reason why I record it and uh, is to have like a snapshot in time. Um, and so, you know, to have a snapshot in time, I think it, I think it helps to have a bit of a consistency on um, what everything sounds like. Um, and, and then, you know, I'm always, the other thing I, I didn't actually talk too much about, um, but the way I started this particular project is I gave myself a year, right? I said, by the end of this year, I will have an album and it will be done, you know, come hell or high water. And so when you're on the clock, you know, every time, and I was always working full time as I was doing this. And so this was, this had to be done and not what I would call like a plethora of hours. Um, and so at that point, you start to say, well, geez, what's, you know, how can I simplify, 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 simplify? How can I like make the most use of my time? And what I found was that the biggest, I had two huge distractions that were mental blockers to me getting things done. And the first of them was vocals because I did not, and I do not like my singing voice. Um, and I did not, and do not like anything I wrote for lyrics. And so that was an immediate blocker to anything because no matter what I would do, I would get to the stage where I was time to write the vocal, write the lyrics and sing the vocals. And I would say, well, I don't want to do this because I'm going to hate it. Um, and that would be kind of the end of it. So I removed that. I removed that as a, 
I consider that a constraint, right? A constraint was I was I was giving myself, I was narrowing myself into a specific type of music that had those elements. And for whatever reason, I was reacting poorly to the elements. And so I just got rid of it. Um, and then the other thing where I was wasting a lot of time was I was sitting there playing through the sample library or looking at every preset or doing everything. And I was like, this is not a good ROI, right? Like, like I am not getting stuff done. I am not making progress. Like, like, and, and you know, you sort of look at, look at the work back schedule and say, well, I'm not on track here. Um, and so I, I gave myself another constraint, which was, Hey, look, you're going to do an hour here. You're going to pick your sounds and then you're just going to stick with them. Right. And, um, and, you know, again, as a, as a band guy, like there are plenty of albums, amazing albums that were made that way. Right. Like, like the, I always think of, I always think of the Black Crows second album, right. That Southern Harmony and Music Companion, which, you know, the story was they had a whole bunch of material and then they went into the studio, threw it all out and from scratch recorded a new album in two weeks. Right. Um, and, and and you can kind of you can kind of tell like you listen to that album and and you can you can almost picture them like in the studio together kind of writing and playing it um i and i just think that's a great that's a great way to a like supercharge productivity which i'm always kind of looking to and b make sure that when at the end at the thing you get at the end is a a a, a representative sample of the time in which the music was made which i think is really important yeah, that's cool. Bella, have you got any other questions? I think, I mean, that's, we've got something. I think you, like Dave said, lots of gold nuggets in there. <laughs> but yeah, that was really interesting because I don't think I've ever done a deep dive like about any of this. So I'm intrigued. <laughs> but yeah. Well, uh, thank you guys for letting me do this. This was, if you can't tell, like, this is something I love talking about. Super fun. Uh, wonderful to chat with the two of you. And, you know, uh, Dave, if I haven't said it enough times before, like so much of what I love about Barabaro is the facility and the ease of making some of these experiments, you know, real, right? Like I remember when you and I talked really early in the company around, you know, the idea of getting a, a piece of music or an effect specifically for the purpose of doing a project with it, right? That lasted multiple months and then saying, okay, well, I'm kind of done with this. I'm moving on. I'm kind of going to the next thing. So I think it's, I think it's an amazing uh, service, obviously, and opportunity for, for musicians who, you know, who want to try something uh, without, you know, going through the rigmarole of, you know, gear acquisition syndrome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, man. It's, it's in us doing this and talking to more and more users, it's it's just so refreshing to see that too. And I, I even did a post about this on social the other day of, you know, hey, are you getting gear fatigue? And it was, I think like, what was it, Bella? Like 67% of people responded like, yes, I have heavy, heavy gear fatigue. Um, but it is inspiring when you can see people creating art with tools that they may have not had access to, or or quite honestly, maybe didn't even need access to it, right? And we've all been guilty of, we buy the thing and we use the thing for 30 days and then we regret the thing and then we lose money selling the thing. So yep. it's, it's been, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a great journey, but you know, a part of this series as well is just really wanting to zoom in on how do people make their art and, and the gear is a means to the end, but the ultimate goal is the art. And, and I love what you said there too. And I will reiterate this extensively it's just getting started. And and yesterday was the best day, but the next best day is today. And moving forward, creating art, refining art, and learning how to dial those things in are the most important pieces. So, um, but yeah, we're, we're super appreciative of the chat, man. I, I knew when I told Bella, I said, you know, we were trying to think of people that would be good to put this. And I was like, man, we've got to, we've got to pull Monleo in. Cause I know this is uh, that you're equally passionate about the gear as the music. And that's, that's what, what we were going for. So. Awesome. Well, great. Uh, thank you so much. This is wonderful. Cool. Thank you so much. All right, man.